Now this morning, uh, I feel a certain way and I'm going to just share how I feel. Uh, one, of, uh, one of our members sent me a meme and I'm not going to mention his name, Ruan. He sent me a, a meme of this picture of, uh, of this, um, this man coming from the hardware store with this massive beam of wood. And he's trying to fit this beam of wood into this tiny little hatchback car. And there's just no way it's going to fit. It's double the length of the car. And under the picture, it had this tagline that said, this is your pastor trying to fit everything he's learned into a 45-minute sermon. <laughs> and so that's how I feel this morning. I'm trying to fit all of that into 45 minutes. And so we may go a little bit over. And so I'm warning you up front to put your seatbelt on, buckle up, and we're going to work through this passage as best as we can. So as we, we come to God's Word together, I want us to get straight into the passage. It's Genesis chapter 2, verse 18 to 25, and we're going to read it now together, and then we will uh, start working through uh, this very helpful passage. So Genesis chapter 2, we're reading from verse 18 through to verse 25. And so, if you have your Bibles there, you can turn there. I'm reading from the Holman. If you have another translation, that's fine. And if, if, you, if you read different words and it distracts you, you can just listen to me as I read. So, Genesis chapter 2, verse 18 says, Then the Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper as his complement. So the Lord God formed out of the ground every wild animal and every bird of the sky and brought each to the man to see what he would call it. And whatever the man called a living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all the livestock, to the birds of the sky and to every wild animal. But for the man, no helper was found as his complement. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to come over the man and he slept. God took one of his ribs and closed the flesh at that place. Then the Lord God made the rib he had taken from the man into a woman and brought her to the man. And the man said, This one at last is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. This one will be called woman, for she was taken from man. This is why a man leaves his father and mother and bonds with his wife and they become one flesh. Both the man and his wife were naked, yet felt no shame. And so reads the words of the living God. In this narrative, we see four couplets that help us understand how men and women should relate to each other. And last week, we looked at the first two couplets. That was the problem and the plan in verse 18. And then the naming and the noticing in verses 19 to 20. We looked at that in a bit of detail. And this morning, we're going to study the surgery and the sculpture in verses 21 to 22. And the wow and the wisdom in verses 23 to 25. So that's what we'll be working through. But I'll be giving you the, the headings as we work, as we work through this. So those are the four points we're following. And before we get into them, by way of context, we are continuing our exposition of the book of Genesis. We're in chapter 2. And we need to, as we look at this chapter, we need to know that chapter 2, verse 4, all the way through to chapter 2, verse 25, is one unit of thought. It's one story. It's one narrative. It's one section. And you, it divides into three parts, this, uh, this, real, this uh, section. It starts with the creation of mankind in verses 4 to 7. And then it gives the, the commandment of God and the provision of God in verses 8 to 17. You see there God providing bounty for the man and then telling him how he should live. And you can eat from everything but not from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And then we have the completion of mankind where God provides a partner for the man in verses 18 to 25. He provides a suitable helper. He provides a woman for the man. And so we have the creation in verses 4 to 7, the commandment in verses 8 to 17, and the completion in verses 18 to 25. And we're looking at that last section, the completion, verses 18 to 25. And that's what we're looking at together. And what I'm going to do is we're just going to briefly summarize the first two couplets we went through last week. So we're all on the same page. And partly because there's stuff I, I didn't say that I wanted to say last week. And I'm going to say that now. And, uh, and so we're going to look at the problem and the plan together. Let's look at that together. The first point, our first couplet is the problem and the plan. Look, look at verse 18 with me. It says there, Then the Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper as his complement. So here we have divine commentary on, on day six of creation. God looks at his perfect creation and he looks and he sees that there's something that's not good. And what is not good is the aloneness of man. 
Man is alone. Man is without a suitable helper. And therefore man cannot fully do what God called him to do. Without a woman, man cannot be fruitful, multiply and fill the earth. Without woman, man cannot fully subdue or rule the earth. Being alone is a bad thing according to God. But God has a solution to man's problem. We said the problem and then we said the plan. So the problem is man's aloneness. But God has a solution and God has a plan to solve Adam's problem of aloneness and inadequacy. And he says in part B of verse 18, I will make a helper as his complement. God is not going to make a slave under man nor a tyrant over man, but a helper for man. That's his plan. God's plan was not to make another male to help the man, but a female. We would have her own physiology, her own emotions, and her own abilities. She was to be similar to Adam, but different from him. As Alexander Strauss says, this means that God created women with the necessary ability, fitness, resources, and strength to be a help. That's how, what God had in mind when he created Eve. He created her with all the resources she needed to be a suitable help for Adam. And then he says, I'll make a helper. In other words, I'm going to make her in every way suitable to help the man. And as his complement, the word complement uh, that's translated in your Bible, suitable for him or corresponding to him, it literally means like his opposite, like a puzzle piece fits into another piece because it's the opposite shape and it fits together and makes a beautiful picture. That's what God had in mind when he wanted to create Eve when Adam was already there. He wanted to create man's helper in a way that she's distinct from him in such a way that she compliments him. So from this, we can see that when a man understands this reality that God created women to be a suitable helper for man, and he understands that God created him as a man to lovingly lead his wife. And when a woman understands that God has created her to lovingly help and support her husband, when they do that, they are fulfilling the purpose which God created them. And they're also fulfilling the purpose which God created marriage. And they are also giving a picture of Christ's relationship with the church. Those are profound things when we think about marriage. We think about marriage as an everyday thing, but it's a picture of a profound reality. It shows us how God created things and God's relationship with the church. Now, we need to understand something that this idea doesn't stop here. In fact, it informs what the New Testament writers say when they face issues in the church. And so the New Testament commentary on this verse is in 1 Corinthians 11. So you can turn there, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And uh, this is where this verse, you see how the New Testament apostles understood this order of creation. God creating Adam first and then creating Eve as a suitable helper for Adam so 1 Corinthians, just give you a bit of context. It's a church that has many problems, but it's still a church. It's still believers there who are confused. And, and the, it, Paul addressed an issue in chapter 11 where there were women in the church that were not respecting or understanding and respecting the male authority in the church. Now, the culture was different there and clothing was different. So if you think about when you see those period movies of Bible times, what do people wear? They wear these long shawl things. And what the women wear doesn't look much different from what the men wear, if you would think about that. They're all these long, flowy garments. So it's not like they wear suits and dresses that you can tell the difference. And so one of the key ways that people would tell the difference between a man and a woman was that women would wear a head covering. So you could know, okay, that's a woman. <laughs> that's a man, because the clothes look very similar. Expected, and it was especially expected in the church as they got together as men and women to worship God and to pray together and to and at that time prophecy was still operative in the church and so they would pray and prophesy together but the way the women are doing it is that they are they are not doing it in a way that's appropriate and so Paul is addressing here the both the men and the women because they're doing something that's inappropriate so basically what's happening is that they're acting in a way that blurs the gender roles of men and women so some men were praying and prophesying with head coverings over their heads, 
which shamefully depicted them as women, because now they're having the head covering, which is what women normally do to make us understand that's a woman. And some women were praying and prophesying with the head coverings off, which is what men normally did. Men had the head coverings off, so you could tell that's a man. And so can you see how that blurs the gender lines? It's like wearing the wrong kind of clothing for your gender, in a way. Can you see that's a problem, and it's a principle that's even a problem today, where men and women wear clothes that sometimes they, they show, they wear clothes that are not appropriate for their gender. And so that, that is a problem today in the world. It was a problem then in the church, and Paul's dealing with that issue. And so he deals with it like this. He first states the principle. Look, this is the principle. God has ordained different roles for men and women. And those roles are that men are called to headship and women are called to help or support. And he explains that principle right in the beginning of verse 3. He says there, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 3, But I want you to know that Christ is the head of every man, and the man is the head of the woman, and God is the head of Christ. So if anyone were to say, well, that's a bit patriarchal of Paul to say the man is the head of the woman, he says, well, just remember this, God is the head of Christ. So just as Christ submits to his father and yet he's equal with him, so women can submit to the men and be equal with them. Christ submitting to the father does not make him less God. He's just fulfilling his role as the son. And so he says, this is the principle. There's headship and submission in, in the Godhead. There's headship and submission in the church. Christ is the head of every man, and the man is the head of the woman. By going to Genesis 2, verse 18, in verses 8 and 9, if you just go down to verse 8 and 9 of chapter 11 there, he says there, this is my, I'm going to tell you that this head covering thing is not a good idea, and you shouldn't do it, but this is why I tell you. Verse 8, For man did not come from woman, but woman came from man. was not created for woman, but woman for man. So he grounds his argument that there should be order and difference in roles in the church in the creation account of Genesis 2 verse 8, in which we're studying this morning. He goes back and says, that's the proof. This is, the, in other words, the fact that God made the woman for the man proves that the man is the head of the woman as God is the head of Christ. Paul's argument here is basically, this is how God ordered things from the beginning before the fall. God made the woman for the man. And so we should maintain these distinctions between men and women. They are different. They are not the same. They have different roles. Now this idea of male headship in the family and in the church sometimes chafes us. And if you're listening to me carefully, some of you may be thinking, well, that's a bit sharp to say it that way. And you're reading what Paul's saying, and he's saying it pretty straightforwardly. I don't think he's mincing his words. Why is it that way? Because we live in a world where this idea is despised. But we cannot avoid it in Scripture. Scripture makes it clear. And we must remember something. For the Christian, whatever God declares to be right in Scripture is the best. And whatever God says about something is to be received as good, holy, righteous, and desirable. Because God has said it. And God is, what he says is for our good. And so even though we live in a world that may despise this idea, we have God who says, this is how it is. This is how I created it to be. And this is therefore what is best. Now one very wise theologian saw this, how many Christians can resist this teaching. And he wrote the following, which I'll read to you, so you can get an idea of why we still need to hold to this. He said, and I open quote, why then do some godly people resist this teaching so energetically, this teaching of male headship and women, women's submission or women uh, being a helper support role? One reason is a smothering male domination asserted in the name of male headship. When the truth is abused, a rival position, in this case, that lacks logically compelling power, can take on psychologically compelling power. Do you get that? Logically, it doesn't work because the Bible doesn't say that. But psychologically, it can be powerful because you see the abuse of, of male headship. But he says then, but male domination is a personal moral failure, not a biblical doctrine. You get that? The fact that men fail in their headship is their failure, not a biblical doctrine. 
the biblical doctrine stands. He says, if we define ourselves out of a reaction to bad experiences, we will be forever translating our pain in the past into new pain for ourselves and others in the present. And that's what happens when we keep on uh, looking at how we've been wronged in the past, right? And we bring that into the present, and then we are always being wronged, always being wronged. And that's a life where you are just always the victim and never responsible for your own acts. And he says further, we must define ourselves not by personal injury, not by fashionable hysteria, not even by personal variation and diversity, but by the suprapersonal pattern of sexual understanding taught here in Holy Scripture. Holy Scripture's understanding of us is what must prevail. And so that, that's close quote. That's the problem and the plan. We're moving on to the naming and the noticing. Just to review that briefly, that's our second point from last week, the naming and the noticing. Look at verse 19. It says there, So the Lord God formed out of the ground every wild animal and every bird of the sky and brought each to the man to see what he would call it. And whatever the man called the living creature, that was its name. So God calls Adam and he says, Name these creatures. And just as God's naming of creation expressed his authority over creation, so too Adam's naming of the animals expresses his authority over the animals. Naming is an expression of authority. Children do not name their parents. Parents name their children. Why? It's an expression of authority. And so the man gives names, verse 20, to all the livestock and to the birds of the sky and to every wild animal. Now, at first glance, this must seem like a strange thing to do before you make the woman let the man name all the animals, but this is very important. God, problem, he's alone. Adam does not yet recognize that problem. So God brings the animals there, and he brings the animals to Adam to show him that he does not have a suitable helper, that he is alone. And so as the animals come past Adam and he names them, Adam realizes first that no animal looks like him or acts like him. He realizes, second, that no animal can help him as an equal. And he recognizes, third, that each animal has a mate and he is none. And so Adam is alone, and that dawns on him at the end of verse 20. But for the man, no helper was found as his complement. Now Adam sees what God sees. He sees that he is alone. And so that sets the stage then for our next point, the surgery and the sculpture. Look at verse 21. It says there, So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to come over the man, and he slept. God took one of his ribs and closed the flesh at that place. So here God causes a supernaturally deep sleep to fall on the man. In 1 Samuel chapter 6, verse 12, we have a sleep like this described. Remember when David went and, in, and went into Saul's camp at night, where there were 3,000 men around Saul, and he sneaks in with another guy, gets to Saul, has a conversation with the guy, takes Saul's stuff, leaves, and no one wakes up. That's a supernatural sleep, right? The verse 12 says, So David took the spear and the water jug by Saul's head, and they went their way. No one saw them, no one knew, and no one woke up. They all remained asleep, because the, a deep sleep from the Lord came over them now, this is the kind of deep sleep that god places adam under so he can perform the surgery he needs to perform without adam feeling any pain of having his flesh open and his rib removed now the age-old question is why the rib why the rib why not another part of the body and uh, the bible doesn't say clearly but there's wisdom from the ages that have looked at this and there are several proposals there's an old Hebrew saying that puts it this way, and this is what's said at many weddings, God chose to make Eve from the rib of man. He did not take her from Adam's head, that she should rule over him. He did not take her from his foot, that he should trample upon her, but from the rib, that she might protect his heart. Matthew Henry further refined this idea, the saying. Look what Matthew Henry says. He was really gifted with his words. He says, the woman was made from a rib not made out of his head to rule over him, nor out of his feet to be trampled upon by him, but out of his side to be equal with him, under his arm to be protected, and near his heart to be beloved. So that's a beautiful picture of that. Henry, uh, Matthew Henry was a great writer. He said, Thus Adam was formed, first formed, then Eve. If man is the head, she is the crown, a crown to her husband. A crown of visible creation. 
The man was dust refined, but the woman was dust double refined. One removed further from the dust. Remember, God made man out of the dust. He made women from the man. So he says, you know, the women are obviously a bit further away from the dust. Less earthy, maybe, as the men. Now, that guy must have had a happy wife. But I want you to notice the paradox here in this verse is that to show that she is different in function and role to him. She is made from the same stuff. She's equal to him. But she's made for him. So she's not equal in that way. She's equal in the way that, in the way that she's made from him, but she's not equal in the way that she has a different role. A different role, a different function. She is a help. The woman is equal to the man in nature, but different from him in role. Raymond C. Orton put it this way, God did not make Adam and Eve from the ground at the same time and for one another without distinction. Neither did God make the woman first and then the man from the woman for the woman. He could have created them in either of these ways so easily, but he didn't. Why? Because presumably that would have obscured the very nature of manhood and womanhood that he intended to make clear. Close quote. Okay, so we've seen the surgery. Let's look at the sculpture in verse 22. Verse 22 says, Then the Lord God made the rib he had taken from the man into a woman and brought her to the man. The word for made or fashioned here it literally means built. It refers to building, construction. It gives an idea of an architect or master craftsman building a structural building that's perfectly suited for its purpose. And God here is the master craftsman, taking material from the man and using that material to form and fashion the perfect helper for the man. And when God is done with this, when he's done with his creative work, he performs the first marriage ceremony himself. Have you ever wondered why the groom waits in the front of the chapel when there's a wedding? And why not the bride? I mean... The bride is definitely better dressed. It would be probably better to have, look at her bit more than look at men because men all look the same. They're wearing suits all the time. And if you see one suit, you've seen a thousand, right? They're all there. They all look the same. They're all wearing suits. But they're standing in front waiting. And then at the right moment, what happens? The, the father of the bride brings his daughter in and brings her and presents her to the groom. Why do you think that happens? Because that's exactly what God does here in Genesis 2, verse 21. God creates Eve, and then he brings her to Adam in the very first marriage ceremony. And so our, what we call our weddings have an echo of this truth, this biblical truth, that comes from the very first wedding in time, the very first wedding in all of history. And so after making God, Eve, God brings her to the man. And I just want you to imagine the first scene of the first wedding. You can imagine that Adam is just coming to from his deep sleep. And God, having built the most perfectly suitable helper for Adam, gets her ready for the one she was made for. He says, get ready. You're going to meet the one you were made for. I made you for this man. And then as the sun is setting on that day, because it must have been evening by that time, and as the, the sun bathes the garden that they are in with golden sunlight, God brings Eve and presents her to Adam. And like a father presenting his beautiful daughter to a soon-to-be husband, God presents Eve to Adam. God created the man with a need for companionship and help. God then created the woman from the man to be a suitable helper and now God brings the woman to the man to help the man fulfill his God-given calling in life. And so, as you imagine this picture of God bringing Eve to Adam, you want to know what does Adam think as he sees Eve? And that's our next point, the wow and the wisdom. The wow and the wisdom, verses 23 to 25. As Adam lays his eyes on Eve, listen to what he says, verse 23. And the man said, this one at last is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. This one will be called woman, for she was taken from man. 
These are the first human words in the Bible. The first human words maybe in history recorded. And it is a husband praising God for his wife. It is a man bursting out in poetry. Perhaps he was even singing. Because of what he sees when he sees God's perfect helper for him. It is a beautiful picture. And in this moment as Adam sees Eve... Everything in his life comes together. Why he was naming all those animals and all of that, that comes together because now he says, this one at last. I've seen all the others, but this one at last, this is the one. Everything comes together. After naming all the animals and not finding a suitable help at all, at last, finally, this time around, he sees this one. And when he looks at Eve, he sees his equal. He immediately recognizes that the woman shares his nature. Just as he lays his eyes on her. That's why he says she is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. He sees she is like him. Like no other animal can be. She is literally from him. And therefore shares in his nature and also bears the image of God with him. But she is not identical to him. That's why he says this one will be called woman. This will be called man. She will be called woman. For she was taken from man. She is equal in nature but different in form, function and role. She is not man but woman. The Hebrew is not ish but isha. Which comes from even a different root. Which means literally soft. She is similar to him but not the same. She is equal but not identical. Adam being created first looks at Eve. And intuitively sees her identity as being dependent on his identity. That's why he he calls her woman. And the word woman and man are so closely related. He sees in this woman his very own flesh. But he sees that she's different. She's woman. So Adam recognizing what God has done. He immediately takes the lead and defines who she is for her own self-understanding. He, he, he defines her as equal to him, saying, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. But he also defines her as dependent on him. This one will be called woman. Adam names Eve. Eve does not name Adam. And Adam gives the reason for a name. She was taken from man. Eve does not walk up and say to Adam, I am woman because I'm made from you and you just need to know that. No, Adam names her and says, you will be woman. Because you're made from man. You're made from me. Adam names her, gives her a name and tells her why. Now you can think about this scene. And God could have very easily have done it very differently. He could have just brought Adam and Eve together. Like a parent brings their two children together and say, You Adam, you Eve, you're made for him. Everyone understands this. He doesn't do that. He doesn't do that. He allows Adam to take the lead. He allows Adam to name Eve so she can understand who she is and how she relates to him. He allows Adam to give Eve a self-understanding. And that's important because that's God's design. God designed men to lead and women to help. And in this picture, he makes that clear. That's why he does things the way he does. It's his design. Moses then gives inspired commentary on this first marriage in verse 24. If we back in Genesis 2, verse 24. And basically, this is God's view on the matter. This is God's inspired commentary on marriage and what it should be. And God has the right to do this because God created man. God created the woman for the man and from the man. And God presented the woman to the man to be his wife. And so in light of all of this that we've just seen, Moses, or Moses can say under the inspiration of the Spirit, in other words, God is saying, this is why. Look at this picture of marriage here. This is why a man leaves his father and mother and bonds with his wife and they become one flesh. In other words, marriage was not man's idea. It was planned and instituted by God. God did that first marriage. And because of that marriage and what he did there, that's why we do what we do all the way up to today. And all people do this from every culture. Everyone gets married in every culture. Not every person, but every culture has an idea of marriage in it. Because it was God's idea. It was planned and instituted by God at the very beginning. So in fact, if you're a human being, you have in your history this idea of marriage. 
God instituted it right in the beginning. And because God instituted marriage, we have to agree that he has the right then to define what marriage is. God defines what marriage is because he made it. We don't get to redefine marriage because we did not institute it. Just quoting Ortland again, at its very heart, marriage is not a human custom, variable according to changing times. It is a divinely created institution defined for all ages and all cultures in our shared, primeval, perfect existence. Close quote. So what then is marriage as God defines it here in verse 24? You'll see three things in that verse. You'll see a leaving, a cleaving, and a weaving. Leaving, cleaving, weaving, that's what marriage is. So just notice that the man is the one who initiates this. He says, therefore, a man leaves his father and mother. That's the, that's the leaving part. The word for leaving here is a very strong word. In other contexts, the same word means abandonment. But in this context, it refers to a, a break of the, within the family, within, with, between the man and the family of origin. There's a, a change in the relationship. It's a decisive break. It doesn't mean that the man and his parents are now enemies, but it means that their relationship is fundamentally changed when the man leaves his home and goes and takes a wife and starts a new family. There's a fundamental change happening there. The word for leave is strong. And the change that happens there is that the parents recognize that we do not have the same authority over our son now that we had when he was living with us in the home. When he leaves to go and start a new family, to be married to a woman and start a family, he now leaves our authority and he now moves into a new family where he will be the one responsible and he will have authority over his own family and he will be responsible for the path that that family takes, not us as parents anymore. And the very best way to ensure that this is actually what happens, that there is actually a leaving, that there's a leaving from the original family of origin to the new family, is to do what the verse says literally and to actually leave, to actually put geographical space between your family and the other family. That's the, that's the most suitable way to ensure that this happens according to God's design. A man leaves his father and Mother, many are the troubles of several generations of families trying to live in the same house, under the same roof, with who making the rules, we don't know. Each family, you must understand this, God works with families as a basic building block of society. Each family is a self-contained unit. And every family has different values, different ways of doing things, and different preferences. And that is fine. As long as they're within biblical bounds, it's fine. But when you put all those dynamics under one roof of several different families, you're asking for something, for trouble. Because when you do that, there isn't a leaving happening. Now, there will be times, to be clear, what the Bible teaches in the New Testament, 1 Timothy 5 and so on, is that there will be time when children have to look after their parents and take in their parents into their own home, but at that time, the parents understand that they are now coming under the authority of their son or son-in-law's family. They are not coming in as parents to uh, have a responsibility for this family. They're coming in, in a way, as almost dependents to come and be cared for by their family. So they can advise, they can give counsel, but they must accept that their son or son-in-law has the final say in his family. It is his family, according to God's plan and design so the man leaves his mother and father and then the man cleaves and the, the uh, my version says and bonds with his wife the word for bond there literally means to stick to something or to glue things together really tight it's a strong word about joining things together it talks about total commitment complete attachment it's the word used of ruth when she clung to Naomi in Ruth 1 verse 14. If you remember that picture where Orpah left, but Ruth clung to Naomi and said, I will go with you. Your people will be my people and your God will be my God. Remember that scene? That's the word being used. She clung to Naomi. 
It is used of, it's the word God used to describe how Israel should cling to him. He says in Deuteronomy 10 verse 20, You shall fear the Lord your God, you shall serve him and cling to him. And you shall swear by his name. It's the idea of, of holding on tight. It's a complete, complete commitment. And what this means then is that the man and his wife are now the primary relationship. They've clung to each other. They glued together. That means that their parents cannot come between this relationship. It's glued. That's why the man leaves his parents, because this is the, now the primary relationship. And their children cannot come between this relationship either. That's why we should resist this, the, the child-centered home that we see in our culture, that our culture delights in. We live in times where parents literally spend all their time, money, and energy pandering to their children's desires. But this is wrong, because one day the children will leave the home too. And you never ever make a promise to your child that you'll be with them until death parts you. But you do that to your spouse. And so you should take care of that person you made the promise to. And you should look after that relationship because when the children leave, what are you going to have? Because they will leave. And so it's important that this relationship is primary. Your relationship with your spouse. And that you do not allow children to come in and, and separate that. And one of the best things a married couple can do for their children is actually to pursue a God-honoring marriage. A God-honoring marriage is one of the biggest blessings a family, a couple can do for their children. To have a God-honoring mar marriage and to help their children understand that you are a part of this family, but you're not the center of this family. This family doesn't revolve around you as the child and your desires and whatever you think you need. It revolves around the parents. We, are to, we have made a promise to each other until death parts us to be committed to each other and to love each other. And you are, you are a blessing that God has given to us for a season and you will one day move on and leave and start your own family. But you are part of this family. And as, as your parents, we love you and we want you to find your place in this family, but you are not the center of the family. In fact, God is the center of the family. And God has given us how to live in this family. He's explained that to us. And after the, this, this cleaving happens, the man and the woman then weave together in the last part of the verse. And they became one flesh. This one flesh idea is very interesting. Because with Adam and Eve, when God married them, Adam was literally being reunited with the piece of his body that was removed from him. If you remember, God took something out of him and then reunited him with, with, with a woman that was made of that piece of flesh that God removed. And so we all would agree that the woman God fashioned from Adam's rib was far more wonderful than the rib himself. And it would have been terrible if God just gave him the rib back and said, there you go. But he got the woman. And that's far more wonderful. And, but this idea of a man and woman being one flesh, it comes from this picture in, in the garden of Adam and Eve being together. And that's what informs Paul's teaching on marriage in Ephesians 5, verse 28 to 29. He says, in the same way, husbands are to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hates his own flesh, but provides for it and cares for it, just as Christ does for the church. In other words... As a husband looks at his wife, he must look at his wife the way Adam looked at Eve. He must look at his wife as his suitable helper, made from his own flesh to fulfill all his inner longings and his greatest need and his need of companionship. That's why God made her. Before Eve was created, Adam was alone. And that extra rib of Adam's provided no company to him and no help to him. But after God took that rib out and created Eve, Adam was now complete and able to fulfill God's commands fully. This one flesh relationship also points out that there is a holy physical unity between a husband and a wife when they get married. It is holy. And it is connected to their, them being in their body. As long as, as the wife and the husband are in their bodies, and their physical relationship is not broken by adultery. They are one flesh. 
And so if one person dies, you know, when you die, your, your, your soul departs and your body goes into the ground and returns to dust, then the re surviving spouse is free to marry because you are not in your fleshly body anymore as the other spouse, you've departed. And so that's why uh, when, when a spouse loses her fellow spouse or his fellow spouse, he's free or she's free to remarry because this is a, a one flesh relationship and the one part of the flesh is, has now uh, changed or passed on. Likewise, if there's adultery, the physical union is broken and the innocent spouse is free to remarry, but she should always consider, or he should always consider forgiveness if there is repentance on the side of the guilty spouse. And that's detailed in uh, 1 Corinthians as well and 2 Corinthians. So this is the idea. This, there's this idea that when a man and woman, as long as they're living in their bodies and they've made their promise for life, they together. And the only thing that frees them is death or adultery. And that's the one flesh relation. That's the weaving. So we have leaving, cleaving, and weaving. And then it's all summed up here, verse 25. That we will get the final, the final statement, which is not a throwaway verse. It's not a throwaway sentence. It says, both the man and his wife were naked, yet they felt no shame. Here we get a glimpse of how wonderful human relationships were before the fall. Adam and Eve were completely at ease with one another. They trusted each other completely. They had no sense of embarrassment. They were not afraid of being exploited or used by the other person. There was no sense of shame of past immorality or past sin. They had no guilt or remorse of what they had done or thought in the past. They, they had complete integrity. Together, they were man and woman, united by God, walking in integrity with each other, living for God. What a beautiful picture of complete trust. Adam could trust Eve completely, and Eve could trust Adam completely, and they were able to serve God together completely. And this was shattered by the fall. And he's only recaptured in a limited way in marriage and only over time in marriage. But nonetheless, we can capture some of that sense of what God created as a marriage matures and grows in godliness. And this is the picture that God gave us. And this is where the curtain closes on the garden at the end of Genesis chapter 2. And then it will reopen next time as we look at chapter 3 and look at what happened to this beautiful, beautiful place and beautiful relationship that God made. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for marriage. Thank you for the beautiful, amazing thing it is that you designed. Thank you that you've given us this gift as part of your goodness and kindness to the world, to anyone who desires to be uh, faithful to you and commit to his to um, the one that you brought into his life as his suitable helper. Lord, we pray that as we thought, think about marriage, that we would be able to look at the genuine article that we've looked at now and to be able to be uh, then warned against all the, the other ideas that the world will try and sell us as marriage, all the, the ideas that are pseudo-marriage, like living together and not committing which is what the world sees as common law marriage, like marrying men marrying men and women marrying women, which is what the world would like to define as marriage, but is not according to your perfect design. If we even think of men marrying multiple women, um, polygamy and claiming that the Bible supports it. And we know that in the garden, you had one woman, one man together, and that's your pattern. And the pattern was affirmed again by Jesus in the New Testament. Lord, we pray that you'd help us as we look at this, this idea of marriage, that we would honor marriage, that we would do as we are instructed in Hebrews 13, verse 4, that we would say that marriage is to be esteemed among all, that we, we would all have a high view of marriage, so that we could be people who, who honor you by living in a godly way with our spouses, and even those who are not yet married, 
that as they prepare themselves for marriage, that they would seek to be people who love you and who, who desire to honor whoever they will one day marry. We pray for this in Jesus' name. Amen.